this is a recording of the second part of um, lecture two uh, with the last uh, seven or eight slides that we have not had time to cover um, in uh, the normal lecture slot. And uh, I'm offering this recording uh, because the next tutorial, the one on Friday, uh, will actually uh, cover materials that impact um, in these slides. Uh, so the second part or the last part of our uh, lecture was on assembly languages. Um, all right, so um, uh, what are they? Uh, so imagine that uh, in the beginning when they were invented, that was in the 50s, uh, they were thought as a means of making machine languages more readable. Machine languages are sequences of numbers, right? So it's very uh, difficult to remember, for instance, that uh, the hex number B3, for instance, corresponds to addition, and the hex number uh, C9 corresponds to transforming procedure, right? So then uh, uh, people assign mnemonics, which are abbreviations of words, to these numbers uh, to make them easier to remember. And this led to uh, what was called later assembly languages. Uh, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between machine instructions and assembly languages instructions. So the execution unit is an instruction which performs these very limited amount of computation. There's no uh, means of structured programming. We do not have loops. Uh, all we have is branching instructions and um, um, uh, yes, branching instructions, right? conditional or unconditional. That's the only way to perform repetitive computation. Uh, programs are large in terms of lines of code, but every line of code will only take a few bytes of uh, machine code. So like uh, uh, 20,000 lines um, um, assembly language program, which you know by means of programming effort would be very large, in fact, only 50 to 60 uh, K of code, which by means of today's uh, executable sizes is very small. Uh, they're different from every architecture. So the Pentium uh, assembly language is different from the MIPS assembly language. And uh, what we want to learn in this module is no, not a specific assembly language, but rather the skill of programming to understand the level of skill. We don't even want to treat the skill we want to understand about how difficult it is as compared to higher level programming languages, how difficult it is to program, right? We want to see what this could be. Um, all right, so we're interested in low level programming skill, but not really interested in a specific architecture. All right, so uh, what we define is, vanilla assembly language, right? Uh, it's not really a vanilla uh, assembly language, it is a restricted C. So imagine that in your C program, you're only allowed to use six global variables. That's that's all. And I have these six variables, global variables are given, right? EAX, EBX, ECX, EBS, EFI, and EBI. And I'm using these names because these are the names of the Pentium register. So I want to create a bit of similarity with the Pentium. There is one global array, which is a type unsigned char. So it can be larger, right? So memories are, this represents the memory and memories are uh, much larger by today's uh, standards. But you want, you're not allowed to declare any local variable. There's only one function with this prototype, right? Right here, this is the only function that you're allowed and your code can, can has to perform any computation, like you know any uh, uh, functions in any other programming uh, language. So we'll see how, right? So these um, variables simulate registers. The array simulates memory, and the exec is just a place for for your for code, right? Just because we need to comply with C syntax. Um, now, what kind of code can you write inside uh, your exec function? Well, 
shares the following offer. So remember, these are limitations that I'm placing, that we are placing uh, on the C language to make it similar in its programming effort to an assembly language, right? So these are only the only variables that we can use, right? And this is all what we can declare as a story. Variables and uh, arrays, right? No other array, no other local variable, no other global variable. Only one function which must have this protocol, no other functions are allowed. Uh, so in order to define the instructions, we're going to define first op the operand. What operand can appear in those instructions? So obviously we can have any of the six global variables, right? And this is one type of lo operand, local variable. There's an index expression that we're using here, right? So this expression will be allowed to be used as indices. So it's either a global variable, right, one of the six here, or a constant, any kind of index or constant is allowed, all right, or is global variable plus constant or global variable minus constant, right? These are all the expressions that are allowed. For instance, EAX plus C is a legal uh, index, ex uh, uh, index expression. E EAX plus EGX is not. Right? So these are this is not allowed, this is not allowed, right? Only global variable plus constant, global variable minus constant. Now other kinds of operands, right? What kind of memory elements? So we can index the memory by some index expression. Any legal index expression can appear within brackets. And of course this would be a typed chart. What if you want to store integers, store unsigned integers or store stored unsigned stores? What if you want to do that with the memory? Well, we convert. So this is a conversion. These are legal operands. We can put an index expression. And this, for instance, this expression will access four bytes, four characters in our array. Right? So that's because memory for the banking system is a byte index array. It's bytes, one byte after another. It's, a, it's an array of bytes. But whenever we store, so to store an integer, we need four bytes, so we're going to use four consecutive bytes, right? So if I want to store an, in, an integer in memory, I'm going to use array elements, maybe, possibly, 0, 1, 2, 3. I need to, to use four of them. Or if I, if I put it at some uh, arbitrary address A, I'm going to use A, A plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, right? So I need four bytes access four bytes in an, in, a, in an array of type character, right, unsigned character, I need to perform this conversion, conversion. Similar conversions will be required if we want to operate with unsigned integers or with two byte integers or with unsigned two byte integers. All right, these cases will be, these two will be very infrequent. So we have a few examples here. So, uh, all right, let's, let's do the animation. We'll simulate a pendulum operand. We have a few examples here. Uh, remember, for instance, that, that uh, A will encode to the memory, and the address of the label is also required. All right, the conversion is necessary because the array is bytes and bytes four, so therefore we need four bytes. All right, so uh, these are a few examples. We have register operand. We have integer in memory, so four bytes of memory, right? Starting at the address uh, indexed by register 89, right? And unsigned stored, so this is two bytes. One character, right? Unsigned in and in memory, four bytes. And these are Um, all right, for code, we allow only very simple assignments here. 
assignment uh, of two operands or assignment the shortcut uh, assignment between two operands right so these are all the ones that we allow right operand is assignment operand operand plus equal operand operand minus equal operand operand star equal operand and all the other ones right uh, shift equal um, uh, percent equal division equal all the other ones and equal or equal that uh, are performed only between two operands are allowed okay so these are examples of uh, these are examples of uh, correct assignments right ex equal to gx ex shift uh, left memory operand ex equals and to dx um, right so you can assign even though this is an integer you can assign assign that um, uh, and, and so on right so so we can play uh, an integer in memory we can add some address right we can place a, 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 an integer right we can in, in, in memory we can add the digit zero to uh, an element these are illegal, right? So as soon as we have three addresses, these are, we get illegal instead. So again, this is a restriction. Only a limited, uh, limited types of uh, uh, assignments are allowed. Go to instructions are allowed both times, right? Six label and computed go to. And this must be, this must be an operand, right? And we can go to a computed Operand, remember, like most likely, these will be array elements containing the addresses of labels. Uh, Boolean expressions, all the Boolean expressions are allowed, but we don't allow two memory operands in the same expression. Not here, and actually not here either, right? No two memory references in the same expression, right? So we will say that this is <coughs> we allow only one kind, a very simple kind of this statement, if boolean expression go to label or operand, right? So here we can have either a six equals go to or a computed go to, right? But there's, we can't put an arbitrary number of instructions in here, right? We only allow go to. That's the only thing we allow here. All right. Uh, let's look at an example. We take the original function that we have um, discussed. Um, all right, and uh, and uh, we translate it into bar code. Okay, so let's see how uh, the translation progresses. So first of all, how do we how do we transfer the argument? That's a matter of convention, right? Whenever you write, you have to make the assumption that the argument will be placed in certain registers, typically, and you have to say what they are. It's up to you, but you have to say what they are, right? So here, we make the assumption that arguments A and B would be placed in registers E, T, X, and Z, and we also have to know how we return the result. So here we make the assumption that we return the value in EAX at the end of the function. So as soon as we reach the end of the function, we expect that the register EAX contains the result. Okay? So, um, all right. So you see, because we return at here, we're going to try to simulate the variable at the register EAX. And we're going to try to simulate the variable T and T with the register EBX. Notice that in here and the function we do not define any local variables. The variables that have been defined in here in power, right, will will have equivalent, but those variables cannot be uh, local values. So uh, if B greater, less than zero returns zero, uh, if returns zero will be converted into 
So what I was just saying that these two uh, uh, local variables will be converted into the corresponding uh, time length of the line. Okay. So now, if b lay less than zero, we can we we cannot return zero immediately because the only thing we can write in an if here is a equal to two instruction. So I'm going to say if b dx is less than zero, right? So e dx is the uh, equivalent of b, right? We go to some place where we can perform the return, the equivalent of return. So what do we do here, right? This will be the label return zero, and we load the return register with the corresponding return value, right? So this return value will be placed in the return register. Next, we have uh, we're going to have the loop, all right? And inside the loop, there's an if statement. So it's a good thing to start from small to towards the outside, right? So what do we need to do here? Well, again, if is restricted because it uh, it uh, uh, forces us to use a goal statement, right? So the first thing that we need to do is we have to translate this expression. Right, and this expression can no longer be can no longer be uh, uh, performed in one uh, step. Right, we need two steps because we do not want to destroy the value of b. So what we do is we base b d x, which is the equivalent of b into e d i, and then we conjoin e d i bitwise with the result of one shifted to the left by 30, right? So this is equal to zero, okay? So at the end of this instruction, EDI contains the result of the Boolean test. And we have not destructed, we have not destroyed, sorry, we have not destroyed the value of EDI. So now we can check the value of the test and if it is non-zero, we have to go to somewhere where we can execute the code equivalent to the then drive. Otherwise, we shall continue with the code equivalent to the else run. So this is going to be the else run, and this is going to be the then branch. Right? So let's see about that. So we can see that the then branch goes there because whenever this is non-zero, we then branch we jump here so then the pink code will be the then branch let's see what happens in there well again this is something that has too many operations so we have to convert it into a sequence of instructions so we're going to perform dax star equal dax so this is s equals s square and then e, the result of that we multiply further by uh, a after this, after this instruction, right, S corresponds, uh, S contains the correct value. We have to do the same here. So you see this value in C is in fact this function. And again, we need two operations, right? We take EDX and we conjoin it bitwise, we perform a bitwise transaction with this value, and that gives gives us the partial result of this expression, and then we further shift left by one. So this guy corresponds to this operation. So this will be the translation of the then branch. And up here is going to be the translation of the else branch. So it's, it's quite clear now, right, that uh, S star equal S is going to be AX star equal AX, and B, left shift by one bit, will be EDX, left shift by one bit, right? So we know how we translated each of these parts. Let's see how we translate the while loop. The while loop is the green part, so it's the skeleton there. How do we do that? Well, we have to compute this expression, right? So remember, EDX is in, uh, CNT is simulated by EDX, so we decrement, right? And this needs to be the negation of this thing. If the negation
negation is true, then we don't have to enter into the loop at all. So we go directly to the return. S already has the value. EAX already has the value that we want. So we go directly to that. Otherwise, we go into the if step, which is this part, right? This part. Uh, sorry, this part up to here. And we execute the if step, right? And at the end of the if step, we change this uh, to an instruction, which takes us back to the top of the loop, where the expression is again evaluated. And then if the expression is not true, Right? If the negation is true, which means the expression is not true, we jump out of the loop. So the jump is right here, where the function returns to the correct value in the register VA. So this is a simple example where we take a full-fledged C function and we convert it into, in, into this restricted dialect of C, which we call vanilla assembly language. Notice that the memory has not been used so far. We will see plenty of examples where we use the memory in the, in the memory in the form of the uh, the start loop as a simple example. Okay, and uh, hopefully this is straightforward it, and it emphasizes something else. It emphasizes that there is a systematic translation principle at work. Notice the color, right? type of statement on the left uh, can be seen as a skeleton that translates into another skeleton on the right. All right? So inside the if, right, the, the pink blob and the blue blob are placeholders for code inside the if statement. All right? So you can see that the uh, yellow skeleton on the right has similar holes for holding the translation of the one right and the translation of the other one, right? So the translation of the if will have two placeholders for the translation of the other one and the translation of the left one. So this is pretty much how it will work. Translation is a recursive endeavor, right? We go hierarchically from, from outermost statement, right? We translate the skeleton and we translate then hierarchically the nested statement. So we can test the code, right? So how do we test the code? Well, here we just want to find out whether the, the code works correctly. Uh, so we can write any ma main function we want, right? Anything here is allowed, right? But we want to test whether exec works. So we load the registers, call exec, print result. Load Explode, call exec, call exec, print result. Right? So this is testing code. It's not really part of your answer. If an, in, a, in an exam question, if you are asked to translate from power to vowels, all you need to give me is this. The main is not part of the answer. Right? But, of course, when you... Uh, solve your homework, you will want to find out whether um, your code works. And it, when I mark, it will be easier if you provide me with your main function so I can verify that your code works correctly, right? And in your main function, you can write any kind of code that exhaustively tests your exact. Just remember, don't put stuff that is supposed to be, that, that comes from the power function outside of the exact because then it will not be a correct answer. Okay, so this is what the code does. Set up argument, perform computation, print result. Okay, so remember, don't, don't try to cheat by putting, by putting uh, stuff related to translation inside the, uh, outside of the exam. Finally, so uh, what have we learned in this lecture? Um, remember also, all, so all software executes in the unassembly language code, so we would like to understand what kind of assembly language code is executed from any language that you write your programs in, right? To understand uses very efficiently, time efficiently, memory efficiently. Um, 
he was devised as a, as a portable assembly language. So keep that in mind, right? It's supposed to help you uh, learn uh, or write as little assembly language as possible for embedded code, for operating systems, for system software in general, right? He was not devised as a high level uh, application development uh, language, even though it was used for that scope, uh, uh, that uh, purpose extensively. And then there, there is much criticism uh, coming from that area about C, C is very bug prone, uh, sometimes it's seen as cryptic code, uh, not, not very readable, and so on. Well, those who invented it were very happy with it, right? So the first is for it, it was um, invented. Uh, every language is a tool and the tool has to be used for the right purpose. All right, so uh, we want to understand the relationship of C to assembly language as well as uh, to other C languages, um, to other uh, languages, uh, C included. And uh, we will explore that relationship through the Ada Foundation uh, theme. So we're going to be using this assembly, assembly language in quite a few lectures and especially when we explain how procedures are, how procedures work. Okay, this is it for today. Uh, remember, these uh, uh, this part of the lecture will be used on Friday if you call it.